trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you do that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, to absolutely, because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Well, come back, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome to Really Radio Show 111B, recorded Friday, May 27th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that'll make you say, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my special guest. He's another podcaster. He's been here before, Tucker Drake. Welcome hey. back, sir. Thank you. <laughs> How are you and Professor Fuzznuts? I am fine. Professor Fuzznuts is... On my lap, and as long as I give him attention, he will hopefully stay off the keyboard. Won't you? <laughs> Won't you? <laughs> demanding, demanding our uh, our podcasts. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering where my podcast is. Hmm. You know, I what? like it, that phrase, podcast. I I think Mama Van actually, uh, who's out in, out in our chat room, one of our super fans, and who who loves your work as well. Uh, I think that she coined it. I'm not positive on that, but I'm going to give her credit credit where credit is due so um now before we get into my stuff which people are are typically used to here tell us about your stuff what have you been up to lately so i I know you had um you had two podcasts at least one of which you've put on hiatus yeah but Um, where can people find you now uh if you do basically a search for the atheist in the trailer park podcast you'll find me uh it's listed that way under itunes and everything else on the interwebs (laughs) i am hopefully if we can work everything out all right going to be adding um segments on my main podcast done by uh america darling curl i don't know if you've Really? Familiar with her or not. She had to leave the uh, Godless Drinkers podcast because it just conflicted with her school and work schedule. Okay. And so she's going to pre-record some segments, and, and I'm going to put them up and yeah on, on my show since, well, I really like her. I think she's a great person, and, you know. Uh, we need as many voices out there as we possibly can get from various perspectives. So More perspective is always good, yeah. I, I try to get as many perspectives on the show as I can, which is why I usually have a panel of, like, you know, 11 people or something like that. <laughs> Not really 11 people, but, boy, it feels like herding cats every time I got them on. Um, but I, I love them to death, but, boy, they're, they taking, they're making, the, making the show a little long, if you know what yeah. I mean. So hopefully... Uh, Hopefully, in this case, however, uh, we'll we'll just we'll breeze right on through here because I actually I don't have that many stories though I could go on and on. Uh, we'll keep it uh, we'll keep it brisk. So, into Scotus stuff, which I of course still need an intro for. If anyone out there would like to create one for me, I would most appreciate it. It would be lovely if you did. I doubt you will, but it's okay. If you'd like to, you can always send it to me at a really radio podcast at gmail.com. You'll find all of that and the show notes at our website, oreallyradio.com, O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O.com. Now, in the SCOTUS stuff, now, it looks like, I, I just have a couple things. There were a whole bunch of just follow-up on cases that they were waiting to hear and whether or not they were going to hear them. Um, but this is out on Mother Jones, not out on SCOTUS blog, Um The Supreme Court just sent a strong message uh, about racism in the justice in the judicial system. No, the justice system. In a seven to one opinion, the court grants a new trial for a black death row inmate convicted by an all white jury. And of course, the one vote, if I'm not mistaken, was Clarence Thomas. Which is just kind of. Weird. Well, no, because it's been pretty well established that Thomas is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The lone dissenter was the court's only African-American justice, Clarence Thomas, who sided firmly with the state of Georgia. Right. Who thought 
can't. We violated the law, but we should still be able to fry this black guy. Yeah, you'd think that he'd be the cinch. <laughs> that he'd be the easy one. So at least he, he certainly doesn't... He's definitely showing that he's not playing partisan race cards. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Maybe he's just playing his privilege card instead. Because he is a Supreme Court justice. Well, yeah, who got where he is in part thanks to affirmative action, but says he never benefited from it and absolutely hates it. Of course you didn't benefit from it. You were too embroiled in it to even notice it. (laughs) So, uh, in the case of nonsense, that's how Chief Justice John Roberts Jr. described the contention that Georgia prosecutors had not been motivated by race when they weeded out every potential black juror from a 1987 death penalty trial. Roberts penned the majority opinion in Foster v. Chapman, which reversed a decision by the Georgia Supreme Court that overlooked new evidence of racial discrimination in the trial of Timothy Foster, an African-American man, which was a factor leading to his death sentence by an all-white jury. I believe, uh, well, that would not be a hung jury, would it? No. <laughs> but it no. would be a hanging jury. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 um, I, I've told this story before on my podcast, mm-hmm. uh, but there was... I ended up in traffic court for a minor offense, and it's one of those things where, you know, the law is written so that when you're going in, you don't know what you could be sentenced with. Whether, right. you know, I mean, the law says up to, you know, the first offense up to six months in jail or whatever. Right. And I'm sitting there in court, you know, and there's all kinds of people going through their, their whole thing in different cases. And I'm sweating bullets because I'm like, I could wind up in jail for six months, and that would just totally screw my life. Just a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like the first guy who's called up, who's committed the same, you know, who's had the same problem as me, he gets six months. And I'm like, uh-oh. Oh, oh no. Next guy who com- who gets called up, he's done the same thing. He gets a year. Oh, jeez. And both of those guys are African American, and I don't really think anything about it. Mm-hmm. The third guy gets called up. He's a white guy. He has he's done the same you know same minor traffic offense as me, mm-hmm. but he has nine failure to appears. You would think for that, that would... you know yeah. because he'd been busted for that same offense. Nine times or ten times, right? And he'd failed to show – and, you know, it was only when he got busted for the tenth time that he actually bothered to show up. I have a feeling that a stereotype is coming. And <laughs> so the guy, you know, he stands up and he tells the judge, you know, I apologize. I've paid all my court fees, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the judge sits there and thinks for a minute, and he's like, well, you know, you failed to respect the law as you should. There has to be some kind of reckoning. So I got to figure out how, what to sentence you. Judge mm-hmm. thinks for a minute, and he mm-hmm. says, 10 days in jail. Mm. And at that point, the thing that popped into my head was, Oh, thank God I'm white. <laughs> I know it's terrible to say. I know it's yeah. terrible to say. Yeah. But it's, like, it's like I have done nothing quite as bad. I mean, I've showed up for my court appearance. Yeah. That guy dodged nine of them, and he gets ten days. I mean, even if I get ten days, I can do that stretch, still keep my job. Yeah. Still be, you know, and and – you know, it was like it, it, at that point, it really hit me how you know privileged things are for for whites in America because yeah. it was like you know, wait, this guy, you know, and and, and in one of the cases with the African American guys, it certainly seemed to, to be dubious as to whether or not the officer was justified in citing. With, with you know yeah. with, with violating the the traffic law and it was like 
Well, How the, is... <laughs> well, well, Tucker, the real the real law that he broke was driving while black. Uh, exactly. That's, exactly. That's really the the real unwritten law. Yeah, law yeah, of the land. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like it, and I know a couple of guys where I work or talk were talking about how they'd gotten in trouble because they had their temporary tags in a place where the police said they shouldn't have them. One one guy had his temporary tag in the you know in the license plate holder. The other guy had his taped to the back window. Now, whenever out of, I bought a out car, of curiosity, which one's wrong? <laughs> you know, I, uh, I don't even know. Well, whenever I bought a car, they've put it in one or the other spot. It didn't matter yeah. so long as it was visible. Yeah. And 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 one of the guys was African American, and the other guy was a Latino American. And I, you know, I looked at the Latino American. I says, "You were, you were busted for DWM." And he looked at me and he goes, "What?" I said, "Driving while Mexican." <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "That's probably right." Yeah. I, it's, it's oh just, wow! It's just insane. And um, okay, there's a podcast. It's really dry, so most folks probably won't won't want to listen to it. But not something uh, to drive to. Yeah, <laughs> it's called Economic Update with Richard D. Wolf. The guy's an economist, so you know. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> um, and he was on one of his episodes. He was talking about the whole thing with Ferguson and explaining some of the details. And basically, because you know we live in a society where taxes you're bad we can't pay you know we got to starve the government and all that he he pointed out he says what they do is instead of you know since they can't raise taxes of one kind or another they just in you know start nailing more people for minor traffic violations and hitting them with larger fines because otherwise the cities don't have the money to operate and of course they pick on minorities because most of them are less involved politically you know, yeah, just like uh, what New York did with the uh, broken window policing. Um, um, yeah, and, and the things. stop and frisk. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, Sa- same deal, same deal. Different sides of the exact same coin. Yeah. So at least, uh, at least we can see that strangely, there's this weird racism thing going on on the on our now eight member Supreme Court. So <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Who knows what they'll vote next? It's it's really difficult to tell. Well, and it's it's really bad when you have somebody um, like Alito because his nickname was Scalito because he so closely followed everything Scalia did. Yes. And if even he is saying there's a problem here, there really must be a problem here. Yeah, something completely unavoidable. Um, yeah. So also with... Um, Keeping in race and apparently the Supreme Court, because that was apparently what just came up this week. Um, opinion analysis, racial gerrymandering case ends without further clarifying when state legislatures make too much use of race in drawing new election district maps. The Supreme Court on Monday ended Virginia Republican pleas to revive a 2012 plan no longer in effect, for the state's 11 congressional districts. The court, in a brief opinion in Whitman versus. Person Habal. Ah, your guess is as good as mine. As I, I would like to say Hullabaloo, hub, but it's not. Uh, oh. Person Hub Allah. That's Person Hub Allah? Looks good to me. Man. Whoever was at the immigration office didn't just turn them into Smith. They probably should have just turned them into Smith. <laughs> um, no offense, person Habala. I, I, you just your your name is difficult. Uh, okay, <clears throat> ruled that none of the remaining GOP challengers had the right to sue because they could not show that they would be harmed politically. So basically, they lost standing. Yeah. Which is always a, a funny thing with the court. And and it's it's something that the Freedom From Religion Foundation often has a problem with, is getting standing in order to even bring the case. Because yeah. of most of their, their plaintiffs are um, kind of trying to be as anonymous as possible due to fear of repercussion from the, uh, from the neighbors. 
Gee. Mm. Yeah. Why, why, why would they be worried about Christians? You know, they're the religion of peace. Well, you know, yes, that I, I know very many peaceful Christians. I also know very many Christians that don't understand that they should actually be, if they're going to be, quote, true Christians, that they should actually have a bag of stones with yeah. them at all times. And, um, well, except on, on the Sabbath, they're not allowed to carry things. Um, hmm. Anyway. Unless they string a wire around their neighborhood. Right, yeah, or just leave leave the oven on all weekend or something like that, yeah. Uh, it's funny things, funny things. People don't read their Bible. Read your Bibles, folks. Read your Bibles. Yeah. <laughs> Highly <yeah>. recommend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so a, a three... A three-judge federal district court uh, has twice ruled that the 2012 redistricting focused too heavily on racial factors in placing many black voters in the plan for District 3, one, the one long represented by the state's only black member of the House, Representative uh, Bobby Scott, where the state legislature could not agree... Uh, to devise a new plan under the court order, the district court adopted one of its own, and that one is being used in this year's elections for Virginia members of the House. The Supreme Court in in early February refused to block the new map from going into effect this year, even though the justices still had the 2012 plan under review. So, if you're unfamiliar with gerrymandering, I highly recommend a quick trip over to our friends at Wikipedia. Oh, man. Uh, gerrymandering is uh, essentially redrawing districts to favor a particular set of voters that will then vote in a particular way. Yeah, yeah. And you end up with a, a district that is... Uh, I forget which district it is in Ohio... Mm. But um, if you Google Ohio Pterodactyl District, you'll find the stories about it, I'm sure. Basically, they, uh, they did this really weird-looking district so that they could get all the Republican voters in, in the, you know, one clump, even though it ran, uh, like, hundreds of miles across the state. I believe I found it. Yeah. And there it uh, is. Yeah. <laughs> and does that look right to anybody? <laughs> somebody, uh, uh, there is some state, I want to say it was Florida, but I could be completely wrong on this, where the court looked at how the districts were gerrymandered and said, no, you're going Florida. to have to do rectangular districts, which means that they're all vaguely rectangular shaped even though they're different sizes and yeah it's actually going to work out to be much more fair and the most important thing is it puts every politician's seat in jeopardy of being lost yeah it's fun it's fun these things that are happening um yeah district maps are are just a bizarre thing um that's the 2000 redistrict, uh, redistricting. And there was going to be something new in, I believe it was this year. But I would have to, I'd have to do a little bit more digging to find out. But yeah, yeah, yeah that, like that I, was in the news recently since I'm, you know, here in Florida. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I could be wrong about it being Florida, but I think it was Florida where the court just said, no, you guys are too screwy. Make it, make them rectangular. So that, you know, there's not all these crazy districts being drawn because they were going to be like hundreds of miles long. And, I mean, you know, Key West is certainly a different type of environment in Florida than, say, Panama City. It is. Um, but not that dis not that different. Panama City, well... Being being from the area, Panama City is yeah still pretty close, but yeah, there but, is nothing but, but, quite like Key West. Yeah, but also Panama. there's not enough people in Key West. Yeah. So but Key West is a little more laid back than Panama City. I, I have a feeling. <laughs> yeah, a bit, a bit. Though that yeah. doesn't mean they'd vote any different. No, no, that's so. true. 
but 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 um, some I there was some article in the Boston Globe. Actually, if Fuzz not so give me permission, I can, <laughs> might be able to find it here really quickly. Um, that uh, you know, you redraw the districts in a rectangular manner, and uh, you end up with, you know, like I said, stuff that's fairer mm -hmm. for for everybody, regardless of what which particular. Oh, was party it the was it the grid, and then the squiggle lines that go down through and and things like that? I think I've seen that that basic image of uh, that explained how how it all worked. Yeah, you know what was what was even distribution versus. Right, right. It was it was it was sort of like that, but it was actually applied to, um, you know, real world. Yeah. Um, districts. Uh, Let's see. I'm not finding it here, real quick. And <clears throat> this came out uh, October 9th. Uh, Leon County judge has dis decided on a map of congressional districts for the 2016 election, one that will change lines throughout South Florida. Uh, Circuit uh, Judge Terry Lewis, choice of the new map once submitted by a League of Women Voters, uh, now goes to the Florida Supreme Court for approval. If approved, the map will pro probably mean a net gain of two congressional seats for the Democrats, but partisan concerns aside, Lewis picked the map that split the least number of cities and counties. Three yeah. map. So, yeah, there's there's a lot to consider with these. Obviously not the least of which is how many voters get for get divided up <clears throat> yeah yeah and uh i know like there's an yeah. awful lot of people in south florida folks <laughs> there's yeah, an yeah. awful yeah. lot of people yeah um ah and we're uh, i'll drop it the the uh link in the chat to the uh boston globe article okay I can pull that up here. It's like, we can do this. Collaboration. Squaresville, Wait. USA. Yeah, How it's... How to fix uh, American politics, one right angle at a time. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of long article. I mean, it's like four pages. Um, and this is from November 22nd, 2009. Yeah. I will go ahead and drop a link to this in our show notes, which of course will be available out on the website, so anyone can can come take a look. There we go. It's right there. Yeah. All good things. Okay. So let's see what anything good that we can just gleam right off the top here. It is continued for oh three at least three more pages. pages. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's not as bad as a slideshow, but... Uh, yeah, well, at least they do have the single-page link. I love it when they do that. Yeah. Um, then it just scrolls on and on and on. Oh, Todd Aiken, huh? Yeah. Oh. Well, they point out that, that if, you, if you had a rectangular districting system, mm -hmm. Aiken would have a much harder time. Yeah, watching the teabaggers. Yeah, watching the teabaggers march on Washington earlier this month, it was hard not to find oneself wondering exactly what kind of district could be responsible for the manufacture of Representative Todd Aiken. So, <laughs> like, how did that person get elected? Yeah, I, I think we could look around the country and find several more of, uh, oh, of God of those kind uh, of situations. Yeah, I, I have one question to ask of you. Sir, are you at <laughs> all the least bit surprised that Trump got the Republican nominee? Surprised? No. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they're surprised, and they're flabbergasted. Can <laughs> I can can I be flabbergasted and still believe it at the same time? Because that's kind of where I feel. Yeah, yeah, that I'll allow. Okay. But it's <laughs> it's like I hear, you know. I, I listen to, to various podcasts from, like, NPR and mm -hmm. folks like that, not just um, yeah, they folks like us. It's um, uh, it's one of those stages of denial. 
Right. You know, and, they just they then, can't accept it. And it's like, <laughs> uh, it's like, who do you interact with that you could not possibly see this coming? I there's uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 there's a podcast. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Last Podcast on the Left. <laughs> no, I haven't heard of that one. But there's an it, awful lot of podcasts out there. Yeah, yeah which yeah. is good. Um, it, it's sort of like the Caustic Soda podcast, but uh, they're they do they're uh, a you network. You to some interesting things. <laughs> um, and one of the guys who's on last podcast on the left yeah. is also on Fox News periodically. He's okay. on uh, the Red Eye okay. program, which is, I guess, on late at night. I don't know. I don't. Why I, Fox yeah, News? I, I try to. I try to avoid Fox News if at all yeah. possible. Yeah, and um, he does a, another podcast called Abe Lincoln's Top Hat, and he was talking about he was, you know, he was on some a guest on the Red Eye or some other Fox News show, and he said, you know, people in the hallways, and he named off who they were, and. Because I don't watch Fox News, I don't know who they are. Sure. Uh, but he was talking, you know, he's talking about these people being in the hallways at Fox News, literally crying because a Trump got the nomination. <laughs> I, I can't, <laughs> I can't believe that. It and it's like, it's like, oh no, you people created yeah. the environment for him to sur- thrive in and yeah. become the nominee. It's true. They've they created it. This is their monster that they've created. Now they have to live with it. I mean, they they you know, they've they've preached fear. They've preached mm-hmm. all this other stuff, and then when somebody who capitalizes on all of that gets the nomination, they're surprised. I don't know why. Why would they be yeah. surprised? Yeah. Well, um, even uh, like NPR reporters are surprised, and it's like. Well, I can see an NPR reporter being surprised because they they would like to think the best of people. You know. <laughs> yeah, but when but but when Donald Trump gets two billion dollars worth of free publicity, and yeah. the runner-up is Hillary Clinton, who gets seven hundred million dollars worth of free publicity. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I think what what was the number for Bernie? It was uh, like two hundred fifty two hundred fifty million. Something was it yeah. was it was two it was two or three hundred million. It was it yeah. was less. I mean, you know. Yeah, it was. It, I, I mean, it was like a third of what Hillary got. It, yeah. it, it was it was definitely lower, and it was like yeah. you've got to be fucking kidding. <laughs> yeah, the the, yeah. O- the only way that they could ever get in the news was if it was like tangentially related to. How this affects Trump, yeah, or yeah. how Trump and, feels about this and all that, you know. And and everybody, please remember that the next time somebody says, "Well, sunlight's the best disinfectant," really, <laughs> the guy who got the most news coverage. I heard uh, I heard a, a a comparison that America is a dirty sofa, and Trump is the black light. <laughs> we're we're all we all live in a skeezy hotel room and well, he's the black know, light coming through showing us all the mess <laughs> I, I i have a a, a a close friend of mine i've known this guy for almost 30 years now mm-hmm. and when i say almost 30 years that's like 28 29 years so <laughs> really close yeah <laughs> Yeah, and uh, guy's got a master's degree in um, all kinds of technical stuff. Yeah, works for a major university, and he's a Trump supporter. Why? Because out of morbid he, curiosity, you know why? B- because he he likes the fact that Trump is not afraid to tell a reporter to go fuck themselves, and that's it. That's literally it. He doesn't. That's care. all. <laughs> yeah, and and it's like that's why most of Trump's reporter, uh, you know, fans like him, is yeah. because he speaks his mind. He he's willing to talk about slapping his dick in somebody's face. 
and and yeah. that's what that's what these people want is they want some you know we have they want the to Republicans, blow hard yeah. well they have the we have the Republicans who you know they bitched and moaned and said Obama violated the uh, War Powers Act with, everything with, w right yeah but they they didn't take Obama to court about it they made a huge deal about it yeah because there was no case. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, 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 right, right, right. Not even Clarence, Clarence Thomas would take that case. You know? <laughs> right, right. But, you know, they, they made this big deal about the thing, and they didn't do anything about it. But, uh, you know, Trump says, well, fuck, I'm going to do all this, and I'm going to. So that's yeah. what his appeal is. Because he says he's going to do stuff, whereas the Republican Party just yeah. bitches and moans. Even though he knows for certain that he can't do anything. Oh. Yeah, he knows that. That's not going well, to happen. Well, well, actually. Well, he, he, uh, came, he came out. I was trying to figure out, okay, what are Trump's actual plans? Because my mother, my, my dear mother, she is, um, she is a Trump supporter. Oh, and oh. And My I, eldest brother is a Trump supporter. And I asked her, why? Why, 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 and why? You know, in that order, please. And she, and she, she rambled on about how he has good plans. He's got great ideas. He's a genius. And so it's like, okay, fine. You know what? I, I have to trust my mother to a certain degree. So, okay, fine. I'll go look. I looked, and, and the one thing that made me stop looking was when he, he simply came out and said, everything's a suggestion. Everything I say right now is a suggestion at this point. Um, so you have no plans. That's really what you mean when you say that. Everything's a suggestion. I'm just talking I, out my butt. <laughs> I, I, um, I've mentioned this on my podcast before. Uh, mm -hmm. A former boss of mine... Uh, used to work with Trump. Mm -hmm. In fact, he supposedly, because I've never read the book, so I don't know, but it's supposedly he's the Frank that Trump mentions having a huge argument with in his The Art of the, the Deal. The Art of the Deal, yeah. Now, like I said, I've never read it. Anyways. I don't think you're missing much. No, I'm sure I'm not. I so I wouldn't make it your audible pick. No. <laughs> <laughs> at the at, at, at you know at the time I was working for this for Frank I there was a rumor going around that you know Trump's limousine had broken down that some guy stopped helped Trump out and Trump paid off the guy's mortgage and I what? so I went up yeah really well I, don't know I found that I a little hard to believe myself so yeah. I, I you know I asked Frank I says you know I told I says this probably ha you know, probably isn't true, and if it is true, it probably happened when you weren't working for him. I, I says, you know, what do you think about this? And I told him the story, and he says, well, Frank, he, he said, I think Trump would do something like that because he wants people to think he's a great man. He said, hmm. you know, any time you did a business deal with Trump, Trump always structured the deal so that you put up the money and you took all the risk, right. but he got the bulk of the profits. And if you listen to uh, Penn Jillette's podcast, you know, Penn Sunday School, yeah. Yeah. he talks about Trump and he says, Trump can't act. You know, anything, you, you know, all the stuff you see with Trump doing on TV and things like that. It's not an act. You he know, is Sunday just school. as crazy yeah. as you he can imagine. He Trump says whatever he says, comes off the top of his head. Don't expect Trump to pivot act, in the know, sense that, you know, you know all the stuff he's saying Trump one thing on for the primaries, like and then when he gets to the it's general, he'll change he his is tone. Just he just says whatever occurs to him at that particular point in time. Don't expect to pivot in the sense that... Sorry about that. I had another tab open trying to communicate with the chat room and i could not make it shut up yeah um, so i'm sorry you i ended up making you talk over yourself yeah that's a, that's okay <laughs> uh, but he said 
you know, but 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 Trump or uh, that Trump has, Trump can't act. Uh, yeah, and, anything and, he says and is just off of You know, there were they would you know the boardroom scenes you'd see on The Apprentice were the result of them sitting there for hours listening to Trump ramble on, and then they you know the production people would edit it down to something vaguely coherent. Mm. And he and um, everything that Penn has said about Trump and my former boss who absolutely hated Trump. Yeah. You know, fits with what I've seen of 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 Trump in the, uh, you know, in the in the media since he started running. Yeah, I don't really hear that many uh, fantastic, glowing reports of of uh, his nature. Now, the only person who was on The Apprentice who endorsed Trump is Gary Busey. Oh, what a glowing recommendation! Oh yeah. Um, and if you want to know, I, I also recommend that you take all the stock advice you can from Mr. Busey. Yeah, yeah. No, um, no, don't. Instead, call uh, call Phil Ferguson. But you know, there, um, <clears throat> yeah. There's a there's a movie Gary Busey did. I think it's called The Wolf Slayer. It's a Turkish movie. He was in a Turkish um, movie, and it's got. Uh, oh, the guy who was in the Phantom movie that bombed. Um. Hmm. Hey, Billy somebody, uh, some, Billy Zane. Billy Zane? Yeah, is that, that, that name? That name rings a bell, but I can't remember if he was actually in um, in anything with Gary Busey. That, no, uh, you wouldn't have seen this movie. It was, like I said, it was a Turkish film. Um, I see and, some things, but yeah, I, okay. Uh, and hmm. anyways, in this film, Gary Busey plays a Jewish doctor who is killing Iraqi babies so that their organs can be sold to Israelis. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's I haven't seen the film. I don't want to see the film. <laughs> I, I mean, you can talk about the fact that the US had done a number of horrors in Iraq, and I will agree with you completely, but I don't think murdering <laughs> Iraqis so that their organs can be sold to Israelis was one of them. Valley of the Wolves? That sounds... 2006? Hmm. Let me, let me pull up the IMD. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and Valley can... of the Wolves, Iraq, Turkish, uh, 2006, uh, directed by Seder Akar, Billy Zane. Yeah. Um, it is part of the Valley of the Wolves media franchise, based yeah. on the Turkish television series of the same name, and was followed by Valley of the Wolves Gladio in 2008 and Valley of the Wolves Palestine 2010. Filmed with a budget of fourteen million, this was the most expensive Turkish film ever made at the time of its release, before yeah, being yeah, surpassed yeah, by Arog. That's it. That's it. Opinions of the film varied greatly. <laughs> While the Wall Street Journal characterized it as a cross between American Psycho in uniform and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Yeah. Um. um. <laughs> Turkey's parliamentary speaker Bulent Arink. Described it as absolutely magnificent. Um, <laughs> I think it may express a political agenda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean... Perhaps. I, mean... Um, I have nothing against Turkey. I, th I think the it is a, a country that is rich in history and culture and, you know, should, should definitely be embraced for those things. Perhaps yeah. not its movie making. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, what, as I recall, it was, I mean, this is definitely the film. As I recall, it was, uh, you know, it was one of those things where they did a movie version of a popular soap opera. Um, yeah, maybe. And, hmm. and uh, um, Busey's character, like I said, he's a Jewish doctor, which I mean, 
I mean, really? <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. don't know about it. Yeah, th- this uh, is the movie because Gary Busey is doctor. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, but, but, um, but Busey's blonde haired, so you wouldn't necessarily think of him as being Jewish. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I wouldn't immediately. No, he, no, I would not typecast him as a Jew. That, that is for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I'm always surprised when I find out that somebody is in fact Jewish because, uh, <laughs> you know, unless their name is like Goldstein or something. Yeah. In in the chat room, our one of our usuals, uh, uh, Stephen Griffith is is out there, and and he's. Uh, <laughs> He's he found the movie and he put up the Wikipedia, which I'm reading from. Uh, so, yep, Billy Zane, crazy movie. Um, and he say Atrak did things right for the most part, but they've had, they've gone from the hardcore secular country he wanted it to be, uh, and they've backslid into a more theocratic one. So, yeah, that that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, um, yeah, the uh, the prime minister of Turkey is a nutter. Uh, yeah, if he thinks that this is uh, wonderful, <laughs> I'm sorry, absolutely magnificent. If he thinks that it's absolutely magnificent, I'm going to say no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of wrong that the U.S. did. I'll be more than happy. Well, not happy, but I'll be more than willing to yeah. admit that we did a lot of wrong stuff in Iraq, starting with invading it. Uh, but. Uh, I don't think we harvested <laughs> organs. Oh, on Comedy Central's Daily Show, John Stewart lampooned actors Billy Zane and Gary Busey in an attempt to satirize the, the mainstream media's reaction to the film. During the same segment, several clips were played from the American films portraying unidentified terrorists of Muslim, Arab, or Middle Eastern extraction. Uh, the segments juxtaposed the stereotypes of Arabs and Muslims in Hollywood films from the 1980s and 90s to the reactions of mainstream American media pundits regarding the film. Oh, we need John Stewart back. We really do. You I know. know. That... I know. Well, he's supposed to start a HBO bits. Yeah, I heard shortly. that was coming. Can't wait for it. Needs to be here. Come on. Yeah. Uh, because the Trevor Noah, he's just not funny. I've. I just don't find him funny. I. I've watched a few of the episodes that he's done, but you know, I. I I kind of quit watching The Daily Show before Stewart left uh, to some degree, so I can't really comment. Um, but I, I will say the uh, – I don't know if you saw the episode that, that um, Trevor Noah did after he got back from having his emergency appendectomy. But uh, – I don't recall. Oh, you, you know that because he talked about um, – you know he, you know he shows up at the hospital. He doesn't know what's wrong with him, and you know he he's passing out literally from the pain, and coming to and they're asking him to fill out these forms and they're like, is this going to be insurance or self pay? And he's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You know he doesn't care. He just <laughs> yeah, wants like, pain to go stop. It's like I'm in enormous pain. Can we ask? Can you tell me after, please? Yeah. And 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 like at one point the nurse says, according to him at least, the nurse says, "Wait, I've seen your billboards. You'll be fine. <laughs> you know, you yeah. can pay for this." Yeah. So, but 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 you know, I haven't watched. Yeah, but before we move on, there was one thing. Busey's attorney, Vicky Roberts, for the past six years, said if Gary played a rapist in a movie, would anyone believe him to be an actual rapist? <laughs> He's yeah. an actor, not a politician. When asked about the moral and ethical implications of portraying what could be construed as an anti-Semitic stereotype in a foreign movie, Roberts declined to comment. Um, probably, probably a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I th- I think th- this this ought to be um, on god awful movies. <laughs> Well, they don't like me too much, so I won't suggest it to them. Oh, so. uh, well, you know, I just doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll just toss it over their bow. It'll be fine. They're, they're an interesting group of people. They're very funny. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, I love them all, but um, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh <laughs> We don't need to go into into the politics there. That's fine. Oh, no 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 no. It's 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 no it's nothing major. I I uh, oh, I just hold on. was a little shocked that they didn't know about a particular bad movie one time and <laughs> they 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 zinged me pretty good for it. So Oh, <laughs> it, it was all in good, clean fun. I mean, yeah, I I'm not trying. I'm not trying to to, to bad mouth them at all. But it, it was it was, um, they they were unfamiliar with a Roger Corman film, and I I was kind of stunned by that. <laughs> and so well, they, you know, if you don't if you don't ride in those circles, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So, okay. So that was I didn't expect uh, that tangent to, to come into play uh but i love it i love these conversations this is why i do this show so uh with that let's let's mosey right along to good ideas bad ideas it's time for another good idea bad idea good idea so i found this out on gizmodo apparently um according to uh, <laughs> according to many the tsa is so bad that delta has installed its own ultra-efficient security checkpoints. Now, this is Delta. I don't have the highest regard <laughs> for this airline. Um, Delta, I, th I could have sworn Delta always meant don't even leave the airport. <laughs> you know, I've been stuck on many a tarmac. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> to, to help well, alleviate long lines at, Atla at Atlanta, their giant hub... <laughs> Delta spent more than a million dollars to install a pair of new high-tech security lanes that can handle more passengers simultaneously, while even the airlines who are happy to charge passengers extra to sit next to their family members thinks the TSA is doing a bad job, you know that there's a problem. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about, uh, about Delta? <laughs> uh, uh, um, they're not the worst airline I've flown on, but you know that that's not saying much <laughs> no it is not uh because i flew on the airlines in the early 70s when they were still strictly regulated and you got all kinds of nice benefits and they mm -hmm. they were really nice to you and then of course deregulation came along and wow they began to suck ass um southwest jet blue yeah, all those you know, People discount express allegiant. Yeah. All, yeah. all these really cheapo airlines. Yeah. Um, now the, uh, the, what, you know, the TSA has blamed us for the problems in the flight delays. The people, the people yes. that are flying. Yes. Because, um, the TSA expected more folks to join their, uh, Asked oh, the oh yeah, the clear or what or whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever they call it, uh, yeah. program, and most folks didn't. So no, why would you want to pay more to fly to well, to bypass an inconvenience? Well, not only that is is like um, one guy. Um, I don't know if you heard the I forget which one of his podcasts it was, but Leo Laporte talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, basically. Instead of you know if you if you went through their their, I think it's know, TSA pre or something, pre screening program right. Mm -hmm. Um, what happened is is you got to your, you know you got to the checkpoint and you said hey I'm a, you know I, I I'm a pre member or, yeah whatever I, they called it. I got my pass. Yeah. Instead of saying okay. We'll send you over this area, and you can go through. What they did was they said, all right, just walk in front of everybody. Yeah. So you were just cutting the line in front of folks, and he's like, that really doesn't sit well with people, and you feel kind of bad about doing it. Dick move, I believe, is what that's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now there's some, there's a similar program for global folk, you know, for people who tend to fly internationally. That uh, apparently they actually do take you to a separate area 
and route you around the bulk of people yeah. without them seeing you. So it's not quite the dick move. Yeah, customs and immigration, naturalization, all those. Right, yeah. right, right, right. But it even applies for domestic flights. But again, hmm. they don't they don't say, well, just walk in front of everybody. Yeah. I have now I have been in several airports uh, where the TSA uh, presence there was one person. Um, you know, very small airports. So, uh, your mileage, uh, and airfare may vary, you know, yeah. uh, but yeah, I, I can remember this was back in the eighties and, um, I was flying from between Ohio and Tennessee and I don't remember which way I was going, but I had like this huge layover in Cincinnati or Louisville, and well, you can get some chili. Good well, old Cincinnati you know, chili. And, I, and I'm I'm fourteen, fifteen, something like that, and I'm really bored, so I'm wandering around the airport. Yeah, and uh, I watch this guy go through a security checkpoint, and he has a you know like an army duffel bag. He's not mm -hmm. army, but he's like bought it, arm, you know, sure. at a service store. And <laughs> he throws it on the conveyor, and I'm, I can stand where I can see the uh, monitor mm -hmm. that, that the uh, security people have. And it runs through, and it's just like fucking wires. I mean, just this rat's <laughs> nest of wires, literally. Yeah, chargers <laughs> and everything else, yeah. And I'm like... What the hell? Well, this was the '80s, so there were, you know, people didn't have cell phones or stuff like that. Yeah. And the guy, you know, and I'm like, I'm kind of concerned now. <laughs> like, there, there's know, a lot of stuff in there. You gotta yeah, look. Yeah. You gotta look yeah. at that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm listening to the uh, the guy talk to the the security guard who's yeah. working, and she, you know, and he's like, "Oh, I'm a photographer. That's camera equipment." I'm sorry. You don't you don't hurl camera equipment in a soft-sided duffel onto a conveyor and then and in that time say nothing about the film. If it's going to go through an x-ray. You don't you don't do that. And it's like, "What? What? Wait, wait." And, and You're like, the worst you know, photographer ever. And he like talk to the scalper, you know, I mean, it was less than a minute and she's like, "Okay." It's like Really? You're not even going to unzip the bag and just look in? Nope. It's okay. We'll just let <laughs> it go. No problem. <laughs> Have a great flight. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Talk to the hand. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Yeah. TSA is apparently so bad that the airlines are taking it upon themselves to improve things. I'm not sure what the TSA feels about this, but um, it's okay. They're a big organization that doesn't feel anything for yeah, anyone, yeah. Yeah. ever. Yeah. Well, that's not true. Did you see that Saturday Night Live sketch they did a couple of years ago where they t they did a parody of the, uh, you know, the uh, dating phone lines, which, you know, are you alone? Oh, <laughs> and then it was like, it was like, come through TSA, you know, fly this holiday, these holidays, and come through TSA, and you'll get felt up. Oh wow. <laughs> okay, so I guess they do feel plenty of things, don't they? <laughs> I see what you've done there, and with that, I'm going to move right along. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so out, uh, since we were talking about Donald Trump, because everyone is talking about Donald Trump, so let's go ahead and give him his free airtime, too. Uh, but in this, it's kind of bad. Um, now, Kinda? <laughs> yeah, kinda. It's kind of bad. Kind of bad, okay? Um, this is out on ifyouonlynews.com, which I sometimes wonder about. But then I was like, oh, Oh, crap. This is all real. These are actual quotes. He actually talked to... Oh, no. This is all... Oh, no. It's true. <laughs> so, you know, th this is not a Poe. This is not anything like that. Uh, so, <clears throat> those that remember this thing called history... Um, 
may be aware that uh, the Nazis were the workers' party. Okay? So, quoting the Donald, five, ten years from now, different party, Trump said. You're going to have a workers' party. A party of the people that haven't had a real wage increase in 18 years that are angry. What I want to do, I think cutting Social Security is a big mistake. He goes off the rails and talks about Social Security. For the Republican Party, and I know it's a big part of the budget, cutting it the wrong way is a big mistake, and even cutting it at all. Now, my dear, of course, these are all suggestions at this time. But, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. The Workers' Party. The Workers' Party, Tucker. You know, um, I uh, one of my bosses mm-hmm. is a huge Trump fan. And is he part of the Workers' Party? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> he drives a Porsche, so no. <laughs> no, probably not. Probably not part of the Workers' Party. And it's just like, you know, and, well, to give you the vaguest sketches of just how crazy this all is, you know what convinced him to uh, support Trump? Um, you know, I, I can't even hazard a guess. I can't. It was the endorsement Trump got from Ben Carson. That? Yeah. Because he's like, Ben Carson's probably the most conservative Do- man out there. Dr. Sleepy? Yeah, Dr. Sleepy. <laughs> and it's like, really? Really? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, twenty years, you know, about ten years ago, Ben Carson operated on me, and I'm, 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 I'm perfectly I'm, I'm, I'm too high. Stop it! Stop it! That's too funny. Okay. <laughs> oh well. It, it was. It was just like, oh god, you know. That's one of those those moments when you hear something like that, and you're like, wow. Does anybody have a gun? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> I'm just going to I'll put the barrel in Don't my worry. mouth. <laughs> Don't worry. The NRA has made sure that there are plenty of guns in the hands of minors. They're everywhere. Oh. Just just check the handbag oh. of, the, of the nearest mother in in oh. the Walmart parking oh. lot. You know, you're, oh, you're bound were, to find at was, least two. There was a guy I, I, at work. He got fired because he had a meth addiction. Um, but that's another story. Who uh, he was always bringing in guns and showing them off and saying, "Yeah, I need to fix this little thing here." And 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 the weirdest thing, absolutely the weirdest thing about okay. that guy was not the meth addiction, not the not the gun addiction. What was the weirdest thing? He um, he was always showing his guns off, and. and in the way you would show a gun to somebody who was an aficionado of guns, right? So he, he wasn't like, you know, say this, I'll blow your head off. No, it was like, looky here, man, I'm going, I'm going, you know, I'm going to have this part engraved or something like that. He was always doing that to one of the black guys at work. I'm, 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 I'm I don't know. <laughs> where, where, where are you going with this, buddy? <laughs> yeah, well, are, that's what... are you making friends? <laughs> that's, that's what the black guy was like to me. He'd come what? up to me. It, so, do you know like, what that was about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was like, I don't understand. He's always bringing these guns in, and he's showing me these things. And uh, I mean, you know, the, uh, the guy Michael. That's that was the that's the black guy's name. Mm-hmm. He he. Was a former cop, and so you know. He maybe maybe that's firearms. the connection. Maybe that's the connection. You know, he understood firearms, and he wasn't like he, yeah. he was not the least bit threatened by the guy. You know, because the guy always, you know, he the guy did do proper yeah weapon safety and 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 you know handling as far as that goes, and never pointed at him. Yeah, he, and as a former I, law enforcement officer, he would know. It's like yeah, okay, he's handling it well. I'm I'm in no danger here. Right. Why is he but, still but showing he like, it to me, though? Why is he showing this to me? <laughs> you know, it kind of, and it was always like, 
Yeah, I'm gonna have new grips put on, and I'm gonna do all. Okay. <laughs> it was like. You know, it 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 very well could have been a ship in a bottle. You know, I mean, just it just trans transplant something else in his hands that is just equally weird yeah, to be bringing yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, it was. I, I'm you know, I'm, I'm building I'm the sure Queen we... Mary in this bottle of Coke right, right here. Right, right. I'm sure he was. You know, was something along those lines. But it's it was like, weird. dude, what the hell? You, you got weird <laughs> hobbies, man. You got weird hobbies. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, and he also hit, uh, this guy drove a. Uh, <laughs> I know this will come as a surprise to folks. A jacked up four wheel uh, drive uh, pickup truck. Yeah, yeah. That the, was diesel. That had you know uh, the, 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 the stacks, stacks of the rolling coal. Oh yeah. Dude, yeah, dude had yeah. four of them that stuck straight up in the you know out four? of the bed of the pickup truck. Four. And, uh, Four, yeah, yeah. And, That's and, three more than that engine needs. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> you know he will always make sure to rev the engine really loud. And oh, of course, the idi- even the idiot rednecks where that I work with, as he was pulling out, would wow. look at him. You know, look at the direction of his truck and say, "Sorry about your penis, dude." Yeah, no kidding. Wow. Um. Rolling coal is just like the most disgusting thing that anyone could do to their cars. It's oh, it's so bad. Oh, oh, oh. It's so bad. Oh man. Well, well and it and, and you know, I mean they you know, they like to pretend, oh well we're just making a statement or whatever. It's like, dude, you're tearing up your engine. No, well, <laughs> you're not, tearing up your engine. Well not only are you tearing up the engine, but you're also putting you know that's just smog. Yeah, you're polluting yeah, yeah. the air for everyone around you. Yeah, Have you ever I, been I, behind like a big a big bus that belches out, you know, black soot, and yeah. you like clamp your air conditioner valve over to close to recirculate? It's like I don't want any of that in my car. You know, no, you don't want to be behind that, and they're purposely doing it, very much like Professor Fuzznuts is uh, purposely putting his tail right up your nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But anybody watching on video will find out why he got his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, definitely showing off the boys. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of the boys, um, while Trump's remarks are surely catnip for his fans, some of his neo-Nazi adherents, because he has a lot of them, may have picked up on something more significant, as would any historian focused on 20th century German fascism. Trump's Worker Party sounds an awful lot like the German Workers' Party, the political predecessor to the Nazis. Hitler, in fact, was initially ordered to secretly infiltrate the GWP and spy on them for the government. Instead, he became one of its adherents after being turned on by its vicious anti-Semitism and nationalistic message. Does this sound familiar to anybody? 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 Bueller? Ah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Just a tad. Yeah. So uh, the GWP liked Hitler as well. They said, after after the speech, Hitler began to leave when a man rose up and spoke in favor of the German state of Bavaria, breaking away from Germany and forming a new South German nation with Austria. This enraged Hitler, and he spoke out forcefully against the man for the next 15 minutes, uninterrupted, to the astonishment of everyone. One of the founders of the German Workers' Party, Anton Drexler, reportedly whispered, He's got the gift of the gab. We could use him. <laughs> After Hitler's outburst ended, Drexler hurried over to Hitler and gave him a 40-page pamphlet entitled My Political Awakening. He urged Hitler to read it and also invited Hitler to come back again. And we know how that ended up. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. So, and now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have ways of making you learn history. Uh, let me. That's my it's... bad impression of a bad German impression. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who was the guy? Um, William L. Schreier. Have you ever read his Berlin Diary? I cannot say that I have. I he, may um, be glad that I haven't at, at the end of your statement. <laughs> well, he he's the guy who wrote the decline and fall of the Third Reich. 
Oh, okay, okay. That he, I've heard of. He uh, got blacklisted because, um, you know, he didn't happen to like um, uh, Joe McCarthy. Oh, and, the king um, of blackballing people. Yeah, and uh, Schreier was a, uh, a reporter for CBS, and at the you know, and while Edward R. Murrow was stationed in London during World War II, mm -hmm. in the years leading up to World War II, Schreier was stationed in Germany for CBS. Ah. And his Berlin <clears throat> diary is his account of all the shit that went down in Germany leading up to, I forget when Schreier had to bug out, uh, in 39 or 40, somewhere around there. And... Uh, you know, he talks about how you would sit there and, you know, he'd be at the rallies or whatever. And he's like, mm, this ain't good. It's like, I, I see and, where this is going and this is not pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, a lot of the foreign press was like, well, this Hitler guy's crazy. Nobody will ever believe any of the stuff he says or ever follow him. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Recently, yeah. in fact. <laughs> well, 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 the thing, the thing is, is. From I people read, crying uh, in the hallway at Fox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, is that I was, I read um, Shire's uh, book, you know, Berlin Diaries. At the same time, uh, we were, you know, we had invaded Panama. Yeah. And he's talking about how. The, the Germans captured, or not captured, but they uh, they arrested a uh, report, a foreign reporter, and they locked him in a room and played loud music all, you know, like 24 hours a day to try and break this guy down. And I'm reading this right as the, at the same time as, you know, the psyops uh, are outside. The monastery where Manuel Noriega is holed up in Panama. And what are they doing? They're playing loud music 24 hours a day to keep him up, to break him down. And I have to say that, you know, they were playing good music like, you know, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin. And it's like, yeah. no, 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 you don't play that. No. You know? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the problem is it would de it would decrease the morale of the people playing it too. So, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, but but it's the thing I how mean, sound works. I, I, I there, there, there's a, there, there's a track call uh, by, there's a track by a uh, band called Wise Blood. Mm -hmm. And the track is Death Ray, Death Rate 2000. It oh, that's is, that's a pleasant uh, pleasant track there. Good name. It is three notes played repeatedly. Dun 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 dun. I actually like that. <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> I'm it's like, sure that that says something about you. I'm not sure what. <laughs> Probably nothing good, I'm sure. Probably not. But it's like... Yeah. It's I'm like, not one to judge, yeah. though. <laughs> it's like, play that for somebody. <laughs> you know, don't play them Led yeah. Zeppelin at high volumes. Yeah. Play them three notes over and over and over, and most of them will flee. <laughs> yeah, you got to have something like a syncopated rhythm, some, something that's, you know, dissonant and, and doesn't doesn't meld itself very well, you know, it's right, something like right, that. Right. Discordant tones. Um, I, I, in 96, I was uh, on a, um, a trip over to, to Germany and visiting some foreign exchange students. And at the time I was taken, uh, I was in Oberhausen and taken to a place called the Turban Hall. And it was a converted railway station that was like a three or four story dance hall, you know, Loud music of all types in all rooms. It was just yeah. huge, massive, just, it was awesome. It was really cool. But I was so tired. <laughs> you know, between the jet lag and not finding anybody to dance with and, you know, all these things and just, you know, okay, I'm, obviously Americans are not the thing right here. Okay, that's fine. I fell asleep on a subwoofer. I, I took a nap on a subwoofer. In a club, oh, so man. you know, you were 
you were beat. To the beat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's just the way it is. Steven in the chat room says that uh, uh, Hitler should have just been uh, accepted into art school. And also, um, Castro should have just been allowed to play baseball. And same thing. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, There's so and, many life choices that, that have twisted the world. That's all he had to do with somebody. He just needed a patron. Nobody needs to go back in time and kill Hitler. All they need to do is buy his paintings. That's all they need to do. <laughs> and, 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 um, it wasn't terrible. Some of his no, work was not terrible. He did have no, a little I bit mean, of problem with perspective. But yeah, I mean, they weren't. You could also say that about his politics. Yeah, they weren't great, but they. Yeah. He had potential. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, he was also the product of inbreeding, so. But, uh, just a bit. Uh, only a little. What well, com it? compared to, say, the Borgias. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> or the British royal family. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just a little. <laughs> really, just... just You can hardly notice it. Hardly. It's fine. <laughs> okay. That, that essentially wraps up our stories. So, um, from my first show, uh, show A... Uh, I wanted to do a little callback to that because we were talking about the first, um, the first in this series of Captain America uh, comics that just came out, um, the one where Captain America is revealed to be a Hydra agent, um, which is interesting. And you know, take that for whatever grain of salt, because who knows how that story is going to twist around. Yeah, yeah, I imagine yeah. it's some double, triple agent thing because that works well for comics. But who knows? Who knows? I have not read it yet, but. Unfortunately, it's already been spoiled for me. Um, bastards. All of you. So now I get to inflict all of you with my, my spoileriness. Uh, but out on uh, Gizmodo, io9, which is one of their sister sites, I found that Comixology is launching an all-you-can-eat unlimited subscription service to comics. Yeah. So you can get uh, get digital comics in, in the all-you-can-eat uh, Netflix binge style uh, for $6 a month, which is pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just recently uh, got my oldest daughter a uh, a Kindle, and one of the things that they have also is they have they have an all you can eat kind of thing too for books, yeah. uh, especially for younger children. Uh, so it's like two ninety nine a month, and it's all the books that she can she can read. And there's a lot of comics in there too. Of course, they're in black and white and the e ink, but uh, you know that's okay. That's okay, especially for, like, the old Detective Comics series. So she's already read, you know, the origins of Wonder Woman, the origins of Batman and Superman and all, all these. So she's, she's getting a good uh, fundamental education. And she's, she's only eight. And she wants to read. So it's like, yes, you can read as much as you like, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Here's yeah. a Kindle. Um, Go ahead. Keep reading, please. Um, the, uh, the, the Kindle Unlimited, there's, there's a few minor issues with that is f from various perspectives mm -hmm. uh, like if you're a create you know if you're a producer of uh, you know you're a writer or you know you do the comics or whatever uh, they have limitations as to where you can make it available outside right. of Kindle um, but yeah, it's it, you know the fact that you can you can read a bunch of stuff for next to nothing is great. Yeah. Uh, so th I, if this is the type of uh, type of media that you prefer, and you just happen to be that geeky, and you don't have the the need to have all of those editions in in the long boxes in your basement, you know that that kind of thing, then this this might be the way to fill that itch. Yeah, the 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 one thing I dislike about ebooks, and it's all of them, not just Amazon's Kindle versions, is when I have a paper book that I've read, whether mm -hmm. it's hardback or paperback, it's like I can remember something that I read in this book, and I can uh, yeah. grab it and open it to vaguely the right spot and find it fairly quickly because the only terms I can remember won't show up in the index as anything meaningful. Right, yeah. And you can and you have that tactile feeling of it's 
you know, the yeah. book was this big in this hand and this big in this hand. You know, I okay, there it is. Yeah, there there is that. There's always that tangible feel, and of course, yeah. uh, uh, dead trees just smell good. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. And I, um, I ha- a friend of mine who's a millennial, she absolutely refuses to read anything, as far as you know, like a book. In electronic form, it has to be in dead tree form. Oh, yeah, it's kind of like uh, it's it's the new hipster way. Yeah. You know, so yeah. But, you well, know, it, it, thankfully, thanks to the hipsters, we still have vinyls, and bookstores are on the return. The The niche bookstores are on the return. Yeah, You've yeah, got a yeah. mess of books behind you. I've got a mess of books behind me. This is a thing. Well, you know, I used to work for uh, Borders in their main distribution center. So I know what killed bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't Amazon. It was their own damn stupidity. I can believe that. I can definitely believe that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, go uh, if that suits your fancy, go check out Comixology. Yeah. Support, yeah, that, support your local artist. That, that reminds me. I need to check. There was a um, ages ago. Mm-hmm back when I was young, dumb, and full of cum. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> there was a, uh, there was, there were two great indie comics that the local comic shop had, was erratic about getting issues, and one of them, they never got, they had the first issue, but they never got the second issue. Um, okay. One was Gonad the Bo- Barbarian, Gonad the Barbarian? Yeah, yeah. It was hysterical. It was a great parody of uh, Conan. And the other was uh, Megaton Man. There's Gonad the Barbarian. Is that who? Nope, 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 nope. It was absolutely Gonad hmm. the Barbarian, huh? Yeah. Uh, Go now, the barbarian, uh, and the search for Uranus. Well, wait a minute. My my pooter's being slowed. Oh, that's an anime porn. Okay, that's not it. Now, um. Well, let me drop this in. This is apparently Oops. a thing. There's. <laughs> And, uh, ah, 1986 <laughs> comic books. Go and add the Barbarian. Oh, my comic shop is currently unavailable due to a problem with facility hosting yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, I found the uh, archiveboston.com thing that I dropped in the chat. If you can find it, that's redirecting you, Comic Vine. Okay, go yeah. and add the Barbarian issue one, uh, May 27, 2016. Well, that's well, that's not right. Yeah, but that's that's. That's the one that I had. Um, the other was Megaton Man, which was a hysterical spoof of, uh, you know, Superman type co- heroes. What was? Oh, I'm sorry. What was that one? Megaton Man. Megaton Man. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> you know, he like when he was in his Clark. I forget what they you know what his alter ego was but you know he's Clark Kent type where he's a reporter. Yeah. And in the one issue that I had that I can remember he's sitting there at his desk at you know the daily testicle or <laughs> that yeah that's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bitten and by a radioactive frog, Megaton Man was the result of a military mega soldier program. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> somebody zaps the building with a giant laser that wipes out the floor that he's on. And he's like the only one surviving on the floor. And he's going, ooh, as the laser's vaporizing it. And, of course, the upper floors of the building promptly fall on him. Yeah. <laughs> split in pieces. Oh, wow. Okay. This is an interesting. Uh, uh, number five, I think, was the one that I saw. That cover looks familiar. Huh. Yeah, yeah, that was I believe that was the one that I had. By uh Don Simpson and Peter Poplatsky. 
Yeah. Interesting. Interesting thing. It was, it, it was, you know, because he was sort of like the tick, but. Uh, yeah, it's, re- he really resembles the tick. Yeah, but right I mean, it here, was. here, number it was, 10. It was, it was obvious, it was not imitative of the tick at all. I think this is pre tick. This is 1986. When yeah, did the Tick come um, out? When was the Tick comic? Two thousand one. Uh, or nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety eight. Uh nineteen ninety eight. Wikipedia it was ni- the nineteen eighty eight. Eighty six. Um, um and then it became it, it, it then it spun out into a it started as a uh, comic in Boston, and then it spun out nationally in '88. So, 19, uh, published by New England Comics, started in 1988, according to uh, Comic Vine, the same place that uh, that we've been, yeah, getting yeah. all this information from. Yeah, there, I'll pull it up right here. Yeah, well, he was the, uh, according to Wikipedia, the Tick is a fictional character created. By cartoonist Ben Endland in 1986 as a newsletter mascot for the New England's comics chain of Boston area comic stores. After its creation, the character spun off into an independent comic book series in 1988. Okay, so there's there's the tick right there on that cover, and there's Megaton Man. Yeah. I'm seeing some influences here. Yeah. With the enormous chin and the weird blue mask all the way around the face. I'm yeah. seeing some influences. Oh. But um yeah. Uh, hmm. There 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 were there were definite dif- you know differences. Oh yeah, like, they're they're different. But like, influences cross pollination, and it's right yeah. about the same time. So Megaton Man was a couple of years earlier. So it sounds like they uh they might have been some some influences there yeah. in style. Um, no problem with that. I no, like no. I like the cross pollination. So yeah, and uh, I have a friend who may actually know at least one of the people involved. With the creation of those comics, and he would know whether or not there was any direct influence, uh, since he did work on any number of other comics. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Well, I, 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 he was at the time he was more into the furry stuff. So. Oh, uh, I know uh, more. <laughs> not really. I don't know if he actually did any anything that was people stuff but now he's he's branched out into all kinds of graphic artist stuff man i miss the tick <laughs> oh okay <laughs> you know amazon is bringing the show back yes i heard about that it's unfortunately yes. patrick warburton won't be the tick again well you know he's getting older yeah, probably but, just but would, he, probably well, wouldn't he have was, been. He's contractual anywhere. obligations with some other show, but uh-huh. he was he wanted to be the take again. So who who is going to be the take this time? Do, do you know? Uh, no, I don't know off the top of my head. Hmm. But uh, I mean, because he was fucking perfect for the for for, for the dick. <laughs> yeah, he really... ideal, ideal, really. Uh, let's see. Looking, uh, no, 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 wait, come on, Griffin, no, that's Arthur, Griffin Newman, uh, is set to play Arthur Everest, uh, Valerie Curry is going to be cast as his sister, Dot, um, and have they said anything about who's going to play the tick? No. Come on. Really? Huh. Oh. Uh, now I want to know. Yeah. Because knowing is half the battle. Yeah. Well, and I just discovered that uh, Mickey Dolenz was on the animated series. Huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. All new cast. 
Yeah. Just her. Nope, nope, no. Come on. Where's the mention? You'd think that the the actual tick, the title character, you'd think that that would have. Yeah, yeah. Some billing. Well, Amazon tends to be kind of secretive stuff about yeah. stuff like that. Oh, Mickey Dolan's played Arthur in the animated tick in some episodes. For 13 of them. Oh, okay. And then Rob Paulson took over. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, My uh, favorite hmm. tick episode of the animated series was the mad bomber who what bought yes the mad the mad bomber what bombs at midnight <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> i always liked uh chairface chippendale uh, oh yeah that was... all of them are fantastic they're all yeah. ridiculous characters oh the urchin <laughs> <laughs> Man, they're, just, uh, they're great and, and um the guy uh, on the live action, who was Batman? Well, Batman. Well, yes, Batman. Well, oh wow, oh, uh, I remember it all. He, uh, some other show, and I'm, you've done something, and I'm feeding back on myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I I haven't done anything. But there there was something about Hangouts tonight where we're going back and forth. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But there, there was some show that uh, the guy who played Batman well did that was, I, I think it was sort of humorous, but it, he played the mayor of a city of, of the program, you, you, on, you know, whatever I, city it was. Yeah, I think I remember that. I think it was called The City. Could be. Yeah, but it was, very it was creative. funny because... Whatever was going on, it was like, well, you got Batman well running the city. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> no hesitation. We already know who all these people are. I mean, jeez. Yeah. Uh, spoon! Oh. <laughs> oh, so good. So good. And it's so good to talk to you again. Do you have any, yeah. any picks for us other than all the things that you've brought to the table this evening? Uh... I actually, there's since we sort of hit on it vaguely. Uh, anybody who's interested needs to check out if you're, you know, and a history. You can find well. There's there's actually a couple of things. One is it, if you, because it's not officially available unless you pay sort of lots of money um, if you're a PBS supporter they did uh, Nova did a uh, program it's called the Ark before Noah which is okay. a BBC program that they you know they chopped up for us Merkins um, and it is the the Ark Before and, Noah decoding the fl the story of the flood. Uh, right, the book. Right, right, right. They um uh, a guy by the name of Irving Finkel, who's like yeah one of the leading experts on uh, Babylonian society at the British Museum. He uh, in eighty five a guy brought him a tablet and said, uh, "My dad bought this in." Uh, you know, Iraq in, in 48, maybe it's interesting. And Finkel looked at it and said, holy shit, this is the oldest story of the flood myth. And the guy's like, well, I'm just going to put it away now and take it back. And Finkel, to his credit, kept after the guy for uh, a couple of years, like 20, <laughs> to get him to turn the tablet over him so he could actually translate the whole thing. Hmm. And it's the, it's the oldest description of the flood myth, and th the arc described in it is round. Yeah. And it it totally predates the Gilgamesh epic and all that. 
and there's and Nova. I mean, the BBC did a program on it, and like I said, Nova, you know, chopped out some of the British folks and put it in us Americans. Sure. But it's worth right. a watch because they, they, you know, they, they talk about the history of everything, as far as, you know. The the tablet and and the uh, the myth and how it was inspired by the Babylonian captivity and things like that and they build a one fifth scale version of the Ark as described in the tablet. Yeah, I think that's here, right here. Yeah, yeah. Let's that's see if I can blow that, it up for you. That's the tablet. Um, the book. Uh, I listened to the audiobook. It's it's basically a freaking college course on the stuff. It's like you know, it's it's what you would take in a semester, two semesters, as far as you know, not only the description of the flood myth, but Bab the Babylonian captivity of the Jews and things like that. Wow, and, I so wouldn't understand that there was any writing on that at all. It looks like. I, I, how he did that, I don't, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean they, 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 they talk about how they, you know, they did all kinds of specialized scanning and all this other stuff. And it all looks like chicken scratch. It, yeah, it, I mean, it looks like a piece of burlap that was maybe dripped in resin or something. I mean, it, it really doesn't look like anything. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, when you, on the show... They have like close-ups of the, the the letters, and they all look the same. Um, but, huh. but you know, both the the the, the yeah, it the looks book, really uniform. Yeah, the the book is fascinating, and the program is worth a watch. The other thing that I will mention, which is, it's. <sighs> What, I, I hate to say it, but it's probably the most important book any person will read in their life. It's called The Auschwitz Volunteer by Witold Pilecki. Okay, that's going to be an interesting one to look for. Hang on. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, you have no idea. Witold Pilecki was a member of the Polish underground. And in 1940, he got himself arrested and sent off to Auschwitz. Because at that time, the Germans were... Yeah, that's it. Um, he, uh, he, got, he got himself sent off to Auschwitz because at that time, the Germans were sending just about everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, who was arrested to there. Um... And he sent out reports from Auschwitz describing what was going on. And, of course, the Polish government in exile found them too horrific to believe. Yeah. And, uh, like, one of the things he talks about is... There was a Nazi concentration camp. You know, there was a there was a guard type. He was an officer. Mm -hmm. No, he wasn't just you know an ord. He wasn't like one of the guys who sat in the you know the guards' nests. Um, who he ordered all the women who were brought in on a given day to strip naked and run around him in a circle and he shot them one by one another incident he describes is one of the uh, the guys in the camp who was a <laughs> he was a quote unquote doctor type right and he was supposedly giving the prisoners vaccines and it was a uh, it was some kind of poison, right? And, you know, they had a line of Jews, and this guy went along and was jabbing them with the poison, you know, saying, oh, well, we're vaccinating you against smallpox or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it 
it was designed so that by the time he vaccinated the last person, the first person was falling over dead. Well, he got the dosage wrong on one of the people he jabbed with the needle. And that guy got up from the pile of bodies and started walking to the quote-unquote doctor saying, please give me a little more. You didn't give me enough. Give me a little more to finish me. Hmm. Mm. And the doctor freaked out and pistol whipped that guy to death. And that's the minor stuff in the book. Okay. Uh, so that's um, um, it's a nice bedtime story. Yeah, it, nice yeah, story. yeah. I mean, it's you, you can't read it without crying, and it's something everybody should read because Kaliki, he's he's probably the greatest person, the greatest hero of World War II that most people outside of Poland have never heard of. I mean, he the the guy mm -hmm. <laughs> he. he at one point, he says, I had enough people and we had enough access, we could have taken the camp, but because we couldn't count on support from the Allies, we didn't do it. Oy. I, I mean, I mean, Oop. you know. My podcast has arrived. <laughs> I, I mean, that just. That, that, Oh, Al, you're made of sharps. Oh, <clears throat> um, but 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 I I can't do justice how to help you know to everything that builds up to that moment and how he describes it and you're just like, oh my god, you know, if he had just said screw it, we're taking the camp, things would have been better for those people in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. But, but, you know, he was the perfect soldier. He followed orders, and he did, he did not leave the, lead an uprising. But he did violate orders and escape the camp in 44 because he hoped that by getting out and talking to people, he could convince the Allies to begin a bombing operation. Yeah, it says he escaped in uh, April of 43, and soon after, he wrote a brief report. Uh, this book is yeah. the first English translation of the 1945 expanded version. In the forward, Poland's chief rabbi states, if he did, Pilecki's early warnings might have changed the course of history. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, uh, you just, you cannot imagine. I mean, there's, there's, if you go to YouTube and, and type in his name, you'll find some programs on him. I've watched all of them that are in English, yeah. and uh, they they just don't do justice to the book. And he was killed by the Soviets because the Polish government, instead of letting him sit down and write out a really detailed account of what happened in the camps, sent him into Poland to find out what the Russians were doing there after the war. And the Russians caught him. Then executed. Yeah, according to this little expert, Plucky's story was suppressed for half a century after his 1948 arrest by the Polish communist regime as a Western spy. He was executed and expunged from Polish history. Plucky writes in staccato style, but also interjects his observations on humankind's lack of progress. Quote, we have strayed, my friends. We have strayed dreadfully. We are a whole level of hell worse than animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you. It, it, it's you know. It's not a pleasant read, but it's something everybody should read. Well, I've often said that, um, or at least I'm I'm starting to often say it. I've often thought it. <laughs> but uh, this uh, this second half of of my show is uh, kind of the eat your vegetables show, <laughs> uh, where there's there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily want to hear about or want to think about but you know we really ought to so yeah eat your vegetables yeah. kids and this is one of those vegetables i think this would be asparagus it'll probably make your pea smell um, uh, yeah but, but, 
but it's it's it's, it's really it, good for you. So yeah, mm. it's worth a read. It really is. I, I you you mm. you read you, you read it and you're like, fuck, I've done nothing with my life, and this guy did more than anybody could possibly expect of a human being, and he did it for years. Yeah, but you know, podcasting's cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. You know, satiate myself with that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. I completely understand. Yeah, but it's like, I... it's like. It's like. You know, you read the you read the book and you're like, man, James Bond is a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's definitely made, he was made of sterner stuff than me. Uh, I'll definitely give you that. Um, yeah, yeah. But he, it, it's, it, it, you know, I, I've, I, you know, I've read stuff by people who were, you know, by Jews who survived various camps in World War II. Yeah. Nothing they wrote is as horrific as what he wrote. And his is just as documented as theirs is. Yeah. It is uh, currently available from Amazon on Kindle, hardcover, paperback, Audible Unabridged, as well as MP3 CD audiobook. Uh, that one is actually the least expensive option at $10. Yeah. And there is supposed so. to be a film version of it coming out sometime. Um, in the next couple of years, that there's a Polish film company that's that's working on doing a movie of it, which there absolutely needs to be. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, that's heavy, but yeah. well worth it. So I've got those links in the show notes. Again, go out to the go out to our website, and and you'll get all the links, and that way you can go and and. Uh, and grab all this yourself um, and eat your vegetables. Okay. Well, Ducker, is there anything else that you'd like to leave the audience with before we say goodnight? Uh, no. <laughs> Good I, enough. I, 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 hate to do, I hate to do it on such a grim note. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, rem remind us how we can find you. Um, I'm on iTunes at the atheist in the trailer park podcast uh you can find me at t park atheist.blogspot.com and there's also a facebook page for the podcast which is you just do a search on facebook for trailer park atheist or at on google for the atheist in the trailer park and you'll find me all righty atheist in the trailer park that would be tucker and, and yes Somehow I'm also on Twitter. I mean, like, I can't remember, you know, because they have, like, a limit as to how long your name is. it, like, be. at T Park Atheist or something? Something like that. Just, it's all linked to, if you find the uh, the Facebook page, you'll find the other stuff. Gotcha. Mama Van in the chat room says, thanks for joining, Tucker. Really enjoyed having you here, and I did as well. Thank you very much for joining at the last minute. I'm more than happy to be here. Wonderful. We'll have you back sometime. Okay. And with that, that is it for tonight. We'll be back next Friday live on tape, in studio, etc. at nine th about 9.30 p.m. Eastern, depending on technical difficulties. In the meantime, the conversations continue on the web. Head over to oreallyradio.com. That's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O.com for all the links right at the top of the page. So you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, Google+, and subscribe to the YouTube and the Twitch channels. Of course, you can watch us live and join in the chat uh, and have all the fun right from the webpage. So you can just go do that. Go do that, would you? That'd be a wonderful thing. But, you know, if you've stayed here with us for this long, all the way through the credits, into the wee hours of the morning on the Friday that we've recorded, how about you give us a hand? If you have a few dollars to spare, maybe, you can contribute to the Patreon and get early access to the show releases and even get special perks. Just follow the Patreon link on the webpage, and that'll take you over to patreon.com slash Radio. Uh, you can also make a one-time donation via the donate button. I know it's so clever. And if you can't fit us into your rainy day funds, do us a solid and share the show and leave us a, a 
favorable review wherever you found us. We're always looking for new ideas for the show, so how about you share what's on your mind and shoot us a note at areallyradiopodcast at gmail.com, or if you're more the talkative sort, 470-222-6759 is always ready to take your call or text. Can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Until next time, this has been Aurelia Radio, part of the Calvin Services Network. Music for the show was created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. Thanks, Tucker, and of course, Professor Fuzznuts down there. <laughs> All right, we'll see everybody later. Good night, good night, toodles. Bye-bye, 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 bye-bye.